This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Is under have our own brother Al, who was a, a confidant, a supporter of the late great Alfred Skip Robinson, a true unsung black liberation freedom fighter from Mississippi, from the Mississippi Delta. How you doing tonight, brother Al? Doing fine, brother. Yes. Yeah, so, so I met you at the Sister Ali lecture. It was funny you were sitting next to me, come to find out, you know, yeah. that you was a, a close friend of Alfred Skip Robinson. And actually, that his grandson was actually in attendance at this uh, lecture. So yeah, we actually like like a full right. circle thing. So mm-hmm. tell us about your friend. I mean, like, who was this guy? He was an unusual man. He was a man that knew where he was going. He knew his destiny. He knew the depth and soul of the devil as well as he did God. And he knew that the white man was the devil and doing demonic things to prove that he was the devil. And he tried to lead back black people out of that and away from that and tried to defend black people against white people when they were hanging us and killing us and lynching and beating up black people and talking crazy to them and had black people doing flips and tricks and stuff. Skip was come to the rescue and stopped that, and they hated him for doing that. And a lot of the black people were afraid of him because of the actions that he was doing. They knew were actions that would not last for long because the white man killed every black man who act like that. And that's what they did for Skip Robinson. They eventually got him in a highway accident and killed him and he was the second or third Muslim minister killed on the highway between Memphis and Holly Springs almost in the same place the same highway and almost the same place where he got killed and when he got killed they left him out in the field without any medical attention and they didn't call for a helicopter for over a half an hour. They stood out there and bragged about he wasn't going to make it. They're going to be damn sure they got him this time. He's going to die. They didn't intend to save him, and he didn't get any treatment. And this is what the people who stopped on the side of the road after the wreck didn't know who was in the wreck, but they saw Skip's truck. They knew his truck, and they were saying, why don't y'all call the ambulance or <clears throat> call for a helicopter and the police out there said he don't need one that's what they told the people out there and that's what the people told me mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so they didn't have no reason to lie about the situation and so uh, <clears throat> after he was killed they sent him up here in a helicopter to Memphis. He was DOA when he got here. They probably killed him in the helicopter if they didn't kill him on the ground. <clears throat> and when I went, they called me, the moss in Holly Springs called me to go identify the body to see if it was Skip because they didn't believe it was Minister Aziz. They didn't believe he was dead. People were saying he was dead, but they didn't believe or want to believe for certain that he was dead. And so I closed my business down and went to John Gaston Hospital or whatever it was called, the, the med or whatever it was, and went into the morgue to identify the body. And as soon as I saw it, I knew that was not him. His head was bigger than a basketball. Mm. His body was bigger than Shaq. He looked like he's bigger than Shaq, chest 
over a foot off the ground. Mm. He was swole up so big and stuff. And I looked dead at his face and stuff, and I said, no, that ain't him. Mm. And I've been seeing him for years. Mm -hmm. And then something told me, look at his hands, because he had a rougher's hand, where he mm -hmm. got crooked. The hand is crooked. Mm -hmm. It's got a certain, when you hold a hammer uh, 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 over a long period of time, when you nail it, your hand will take a certain shape for mm -hmm. take, holding that hammer. Mm -hmm. And I knew that about his hand because I used to joke about his hands being crooked. I call it hammer hand. Mm -hmm. And I reached down under the sheet and pulled his hand out and put my hand in his hand and started crying because I knew that was him. Mm. I knew that was him then. And I recognized him by his hand shake. Nothing physical or visible about him let me know it was him. He was so messed up. Wow. But when I put my hand in his hand, it's like a hand in a glove. Wow. I knew that was him. And so then, then I looked at him and I, I could kind of see <clears throat> that he had just was swole up unbelief, or beyond belief. So he had to suffer a long time for his head to physically be bigger than a basketball. He had to swell up and suffer a whole lot to swell up that big. For you to swell, you got to still be alive. Your heart got to still be beating. Mm. When you die, wherever, whenever your heart stop beating, your body will stop swelling at that point. Mm -hmm. So if you swole up, and, and he was a real thin man, and I was down there 300 pounds, and he looked like he was twice as big as me. And and uh, normally, Skip Robinson probably didn't weigh but 120, 30 pounds. You know, and for to see him in that condition, that swole up, I just couldn't believe it. You know, but that was him. And after they deflated him and embalmed him and got all that swelling out of him and stuff, he looked just like himself. Because he had the most beautiful black Shiny, smooth skin you could ever want to see. Mm. He looked good mm. all the time. He had a smile that was just beyond belief. Mm. And so that hurt me a lot. And then the sisters from Mississippi came up after me. And they said, that's not him. I said, yeah, that's him. I, I put my eyes in his hand, them crooked hands. And then they said, yeah, it sure is him. It was Sister Patricia, Sister Akila, and Sister Dorothy. Those three sisters came up and met me in the morgue. After I was there, they came in the morgue after I had identified it mm. and said that, yeah, that's him. Uh, wow. So, like, this was December 18th, 1986, why I recall. Right. And so... Mm. What was the official cause of death? What did they say? Can you remember? No, I don't know what they used as official cause of death. They just said the wreck, you know, trauma, blunt trauma from being in a wreck. So I, I, so it was an accident, so he ran, they say he allegedly ran behind that truck? Yeah, they said he crossed the line and hit a truck, or a truck crossed the line and hit him. We never got it straight. Some, some people say he had fallen asleep. And mm -hmm. then some people say he hadn't, so we don't know actually what happened. But another minister had got killed in the same spot on the same highway uh, three or four years before him. Wow. So you think it was, oh, wow. So Same spot. So I'm just saying this is more than a coincidence, and I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe anything I know and I don't know. I got proof I don't have proof. And so I think that's something that we need to give some consideration. But the Klan had already had out that they were going to kill him. Mm. They had been saying that for years. They were going to kill that nigga if it's the last thing they do. And the police hated him. And the Klan hated him. And all the white folk hated him. But the black people down there loved his draws just like I did. Mm. They loved it. He was a man's man. Yeah. 
So it's like he had that package, like he had charisma. He had it all. The looks, the oratory. Yeah, yeah. The spirit, the wisdom, the intelligence. And he would discuss stuff. He would break it down, deal with the foundation, and take it all the way up into the clouds. So were you a part of his United League? Or were you a part of that? No, I wasn't a part of any of those things. I didn't meet him until we lost the minister in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And we had another couple of ministers who didn't want to do right in Islam. And then Minister Farrakhan put Aziz over Holly Springs and Memphis. Mm. And then I, that's when I met Aziz. And he was extremely knowledgeable, and he had the right spirit, and he could enthuse people, and and he was just a good leader. He just had everything you could look for on a man. That God wanted in a man, he found it in Aziz, or put it in Aziz. Yeah, he had it all. All the sisters loved him. Mm -hmm. All the brothers loved him. Mm. That is unusual. So it's uh, like women want to be with him and brothers want to be like him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow. And I, so I, I couldn't see it better. So I, my thing is this though, man. Like it's crazy to me that I, I go research online. I pull up archives from Ebony and Jet. He's everywhere, mm -hmm. like speaking here and there, receiving international awards. But when I talk to civil rights historians, the people from that period who studied that period, right. you don't know who he is. Right, because he was only he was large as. It, he was as big as Elvis Presley is in Memphis, mm -hmm. in Holly Springs. Mm. I, I, that's the best way to put it. In Holly Springs, he was as well known as Elvis Presley was in Memphis. So why is the historians overlooking him? Why do people out there don't know who they he is? They want to overlook him because he's a very bad example for other black men to emulate and follow because he didn't take no crap. Mm. And he stayed on his job and did what he was supposed to do and said what he was supposed to say. And he wasn't a white man friend. He wasn't scratching and itching and ducking and bowing and all that old stuff around white folk. He was looking them straight in the eye, talking to them like a man to man. And if they didn't like it, then that was their problem. Yeah, cause I know it's interesting with him. Like I heard a speech he did back in 1978 at UMass. And he basically predicted all the things that came to pass with black America and with America in general. Yeah, he did that often. He, he went over things that were, were to come and things are still happening just like he said they would. So wow, so he was like, will you call him a prophet or? or? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, he, he, he called it right. He understood one of the few men who actually mastered the Bible mm. and mastered the Quran. Mm. Not many men do that. They'll master one or the other, but not both. And can't put them both together because they both are saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Both books telling the same stories. But it's like in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all telling the stories about Jesus. Each one has a different perspective. Mm. And that's the way the stories in the Bible and the Quran are. They telling the same stories about the same people, but from different perspectives. They got each one has something that the other story doesn't tell, and and each one has uh, uh, leaves out some details that the other one has in. And that's the way it is with the Bible and the Quran. But if you put the Bible and the Quran together, they're a perfect match. Wow. They, 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 they're saying the same thing the same way at the same time and they're in harmony and in tune with each other and the world and the world headlines and all the current events they're in sync with what the Bible and the Quran are saying and predicting now how, well how do you know the story about how he got involved in Islam by any chance the back story behind it do you know it yes he Went to see Minister Farrakhan one time. I don't remember what the details were. I think he asked Farrakhan to come and speak for him or something one time. And Farrakhan came down there and talked to him and did whatever he was asking to do to help him out with, you know, with Holly Springs. And I think that the minister saw the quality of the man that he was and said, wow, 
this guy can do all this with no Islam. <laughs> Imagine what he could do if we, once he get these teachings mm -hmm. about who he is and who the black man is and stuff, because he had no clue at that time. Mm -hmm. And so once he got with Farrakhan, he became the minister. Farrakhan made him the minister over Mississippi. And the Mississippi Moss had 10 times the people in it that the Memphis Moss had. Mm. And the Memphis Moss started before Elijah Muhammad died. Mm. But after Skip Robinson got uh, uh, to be Abdul Aziz Muhammad, the mighty one he was, he brought in so many people in Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, all around Tupelo, everywhere, all over Mississippi, black people were coming up to Holly Springs every Sunday wow. to worship with him. And then Memphis started going down there. They closed down the Memphis Mosque oh, wow. and put the Memphis Mosque up under Aziz. Then he came back to Memphis and started the mosque here. He would have a service in Holly Springs in the morning at 10 o'clock, and then he'd come at 2 o'clock to Memphis and have another service. And the people in Memphis would go down to Holly Springs for the morning teaching for Holly Springs, and then they'd come back to Memphis and hear Aziz again for the Memphis meeting at 2 o'clock. And the people from Mississippi and they were all down for us, Jackson and below, were coming up to Memphis to hear him teach again every wow. Sunday. That's a fact of life, yes sir. And you wow. can ask anybody that. that that's, 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 that's very common knowledge again, uh, among any Muslim in Memphis or uh, Mississippi at that time that would know that. So I'm figuring that when he became a minister of that type of renown, and you know, being that busy with the ministry, was he actually active still with the movement in terms of like, I heard stories of him getting the shootout with the Klan and Tupelo and Hollywood. All Spring. that stuff was before he was a Muslim minister. Okay. And after he got to be a Muslim minister, he got more finesse. He learned to deal with the devil another way, or the okay. white man, he learned to deal with the white man another way. Instead of fighting him on his terms and his ground, just let the devil run wild for a minute and he, Aziz, concentrate on resurrecting the black man from his condition, mental condition of slavery that he had and his mental of no self or knowing nothing of self and his God. And so once he started putting, resurrecting black men and standing black men up erect, then black men in Mississippi and in Tennessee in Memphis began to erect themselves and started being the God uh, driven people that they were supposed to be and started liking themselves and appreciating themselves for themselves because the nation uh, of Islam teaches accept yourself, be yourself be yourself and accept yourself and accept your brothers and so we had not had that type of teaching and stuff before Aziz and how he learned so much of Islam in such a short amount of time, I'll never know. Mm, somebody asked you this. I mean, he was very popular among his constituents and all this stuff. Among all black people among from all Holly Springs to Memphis, yeah. And Especially so it, in, in Mississippi. Yeah, I want to ask you this. He said he was a, you know, he became an expert of Islam in a, in a, right. in a short period of time. Yes, sir. He very was. charismatic, great orator. Right. Did you do you feel like uh, Minister Farrakhan saw him as a threat, or you think that he saw? Oh him? no, he saw him as the compliment that he was, and mm -hmm. the compliment that he needed. In fact, Minister Farrakhan put Aziz over the southeast part of the United States, made him the head minister over everything from Tennessee down to the Gulf and from Tennessee over to the Atlantic. Wow. He put him as the head minister of the southeast part of the United States. In other words, he was destined to be the spokesman for the nation of Islam. He was going to be in the position that Khalid was in after Khalid had been set down. Wow. That's where, that's where he was headed. Wow. And there's no question about that. Wow. Yeah, hold yeah. that record. I'm gonna ask you this: like, Did Khalid? Did he? Uh, was he aware of uh, Minister 
Aziz? Yeah, he loved Aziz, and Aziz loved him. They talked well with each other, worked well together, uh, had dinner together. Uh, Khaled would come down and speak in the mosque uh, in Holly Springs often. Mm -hmm. Often. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, two or three times a year, he would be in Holly Springs speaking. Khaled would come and speak for Aziz down there to the people and stuff. And so uh, that's the first time I met Khaled was in Holly Springs. Not in Memphis, but in Holly Springs. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So while you got these two giants right here, don't they? <laughs> great orators, great presence, charisma, yeah. and everything. Khaled was a real fireball. Mm. Yeah. And gone too soon. Like, what gone you got? way too soon. Let me ask you this. Like, you know, people, I won't bring up Farrakhan again because people got this thing. Mm -hmm. When Farrakhan was trained by Brother Malcolm X, then he had people like uh, Brother Khalid Muhammad and Brother mm -hmm. uh, Aziz, uh, Brother Skip Robson, come under him. Is there a, a dark cloud over Farrakhan? These guys, these brothers come in his life. It's like they exit early. No, it, it just happened to be like that. Minister Farrakhan has been the most astute of all of them. He understands and knows how to play the game better than the rest of them did. The others mm -hmm. were hard line and hardcore and ready to make the whatever the sacrifice is necessary. We gonna give out get our piece of the pie now or we gonna die. And Brother Farrakhan always had the temperament to wait because he knew that the people weren't ready and it would just be a slaughter mm. on the part by the devil to do that. And so, uh, rightfully so, Farrakhan kept that from happening. And while I loved Brother Collins' underwear mm. and I always loved him, he was a man's man too. He was a little rash and brash and a little... Uh, we were a little ahead of schedule for fighting the white man. We didn't have enough structure, enough organization. Uh, uh, most of us didn't even have a cap gun, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it would not have been the best course of action at that time. We should have waited as Brother Farrakhan asked them to do. And uh, we could have prepared better and dealt with this thing better to to stop it, but uh, the white folk got rid of college because he had got so bad talking about white folk and calling the white woman Miss Ann, Miss Ann and Boyd Butt, mm. and all kind of bad talk about white folk and the white man was the devil in the flesh and that they ought to be dug up and rehung and shoot them again in the ground in the casket and all that kind of rhetoric. Uh, caused the demise of him. It, it enraged the white people that a so-called nigger would have the audacity, the, the, the gonads, the, the nerve to come out and say something like that in the public and not be shamed and not hide itself or get behind a mask or behind a wall and say that. But he would come out in the light, in the daytime, in the public and address all white people who, if they wanted to hear and tell them about themselves straight up. And they just wasn't used to that. And Farrakhan told him that was a very bad idea. And it, it was a very bad idea at that time. But if Collett had been on the low, but once the the FBI knows about you, and they knew how Collett was a hardline, hardcore person way back in the 60s, mm -hmm. they knew that about Collett. So even if he had toned the rhetoric down and got in line, the government, the FBI, the CIA, with they no good ass, they still would have been watching him and plotting against him and stuff to destroy him because they know he didn't play and wasn't playing. And he was serious and would act on him. And so they knew he was capable of being a general over an army, hmm. that he could lead the men, the men would follow him. Especially with him carrying the banner of uh, Islam and and uh, under Brother Farrakhan, it, 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 he he could he was the only person that could have sat in that seat of leadership over all the black men in the country, and so that's why they had to get him killed. And if anybody knew 
uh, Khaled, he not only looked like the picture of hell, he was the picture of hell. He had a, uh, he looked just exactly like the statue of the uh, uh, Academy Awards, the Emmy, mm -hmm. whatever the it Oscars, is. Yeah. Oscar. He looked like the, the statue of the Oscar. Mm. Big arms, big chest, face shining, looked like black onyx. And he mm. was black as he could be. Mm. And handsome and cool and tempered as he could be. And chisel out arms, chest, legs, everything. Hands. He just had it all. He was about 6'2 or 6'3. And was uh, looked like a weightlifter, looked like a black Superman, mm. you know, when you see him. And he always was dressed up in some nice fitted suit or something. That, you know, he just just looked like he was ready to just bust your head or bust open <laughs> whatever need to be torn up. He just just that kind of brother. He just he just had it all. Wow. And the women loved him, mm -hmm. and the brothers loved him. Oh, and the sisters didn't love him any more than the brothers loved him. Mm. And they loved his underwear. Wow. Yes, sir. So what well, Alfred, he was interested to me because these guys, they city guys, like Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. Not all the guys city guys, but he right. stayed in the country. He didn't go up into the big city. So what did he have to offer in terms of that from that point of view? Aziz was as country as uh What's this guy where they go fishing? Got the guy, the, the sheriff, to be with him. Oh, uh, yeah. John Knox. Yeah, Barney Fife. Barney Fife and stuff. <laughs> Andy Griffin. Andy Griffin. Yeah, yeah he, he was almost that country. Mm. He really was. But at the same time, he was not naive in any way about life. And about the white man, he just had that southern charm and that southern style and that southern acumen. Mm -hmm. But he was a real fireball. Mm -hmm. I mean, a real fireball. And he he knew what to do, what to say and how to say it. And when he would speak, he would have the whole church crying. It wouldn't be enough tissue or napkins in a church. He would talk. Everywhere he went to speak, the people would cry like they was going out of style, like mm. it's going out of style. Mm. Muslims and the Christian, and you hardly, I've never seen the Muslims cry at any meeting before, wow. till Aziz and all of them, all hardline brothers, brothers who didn't want to follow, uh, you know, want to follow right and, and just. He just had that kind of charisma where people would just cry. You know, he'd make people cry. He could, he could paint pictures so so real you could just see it. You could, you could pass seeing You would just feel like you were actually in the battle or in whatever he was seeing, going up in the sky or going in the ground. I mean, he just could captivate the man. So and paint such a realistic picture, you couldn't miss it. Couldn't miss it. Yeah, he 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 was the man. Yeah. Was it like any footage of him, like video footage. Or? I'm sure somebody has some somewhere of him doing that, but I don't know who has it. I would love to have some of that footage on him, mm. and I think it's very worthwhile, and it would be extremely rewarding for anybody that would go out and find, it, take that task and find some of that video on him, because the world is looking for it. The world needs it. Especially with such a timely message that he had way back then. Is is it would be the headlines today. You would need to read the paper. Mm. That's yeah. excellent. Do you, so do, can you recall the funeral services for uh, Yeah, Aziz? Mr. Farrakhan did the eulogy of of uh Aziz. Mm -hmm. He came down from Chicago and did the eulogy for him for the whole, he was there the whole day for the funeral and stuff. And uh, he was with Brother Aziz's brother, I can't remember his name. He's a professor, mm -hmm. college professor. And, uh, but he spent that time with him and they discussed a lot of things, I'm sure, and talked, but you know, I wasn't privileged to all that detail. I wasn't at none of that stuff, but they spent a lot of time together 
and, and Mr. Farrakhan never spends that kind of time anywhere normally. Wow. He, 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 not at that time. He might spend that time somewhere now a little bit. But back then, never, ever, never, ever, none of that kind. But he, he stayed a long time down here about Aziz. And any time that Aziz would call Minister Farrakhan to come down here, he would come. Wow. Yes, sir. He would come every single time without fail. Wow. So he know he really lost somebody when he lost. The nation, black people, the nation of Islam, and all the black people in America, we lost our number two man. The only man that was over him would be Mr. Farrakhan himself. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he had a greater leadership and charisma spirit than Minister Farrakhan. Wow, that's now, somebody it, might want to kill me for saying that, <laughs> but don't kill me for saying it because it's true. I'm just the messenger. It's not my message. I'm just quoting the truth. Wow. So yeah. where was the funeral held? You remember, like, was it in Memphis or Mississippi? It was or? in Mississippi. At the mosque? Or? At uh, Russ College. Mm. It was at Russ College. Uh, it was, was the it? only place big mm. enough to hold it. Wow, so it was And it? it was full. It was overcrowded. Was it recorded by any chance? I don't know. I would imagine so, but I don't know. Yeah, wow. I hope it was. It should have been. That's excellent. Wow. So, like, I'm going to ask you this. Like, um... Like with brother, with brother uh, Skip, like I understand, my understanding, I won't you correct me or not, that the reason why he got involved in the uh, Black Liberation Movement, he was trying to find the killers of Emmett Till. Was that true? Not per se. That was part of it. But the main thing he did is he was a, the leader, the champion of Black civil rights in North Mississippi. And the work that he was doing there led him to intercourse with Minister Farrakhan. And that's how they got together. He got Brother Farrakhan to help him rally attention and people to his cause. Mm. And by getting Brother Farrakhan down here, which when he called him to come, he came, Minister Farrakhan saw him and saw what a huge statue, what a monument of a man and a god that he was. Minister Farrakhan asked him to be on his team, asked Abzul Aziz to be on his team. Or Skip Robinson at that time, he wanted Skip Robinson on his team. Mm. And that's how he got on there. So, but it was Farrakhan that gave him his name, his Islamic name? Absolutely. Wow. Mm -hmm. Most people go through uh, X before they get a name, but I don't think he got an X. I think Minister Farrakhan gave him a name off the top, which says it all. Wow. So well, how, well, how you say his name was? How you use Abdul Aziz Muhammad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's just like when uh, certain personalities come. Some men are such a stature, uh, such a man of consequence, like uh, Muhammad Ali. When right. he came into the nation, he was studying to get an X. I don't know if he ever got an X or they just gave him his name, but he wasn't an X long because Elijah Muhammad said, this brother's a real fireball. Mm. He need a name of God now. He deserves a name of God now. Cause this brother's smart, intelligent, high intellect, and doing all this stuff, talking back to the folk, mm -hmm. talking back to the government. He's sassing the government. Right. Of the United States, he said, I'm giving this man a holy name right now. Well, he gave it before he gave it to Malcolm X. He never gave Malcolm the name like that, right? Right. M Malcolm X never got his name. Malcolm, I think, named himself. Wow, that says a lot, you know, yeah. considering. Right. I mean, when you say that Malcolm actually helped build the nation and really grew it. Yeah, he did. Fair he grew, yeah, it'd be fair, quite fair to say that. Mm -hmm. But he grew it. A lot of people don't want to give credit where it's due they, because they, they have an agenda. I don't have an agenda. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm a man that does not believe anything. Nothing. I know or I don't know. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do I believe in God? 
Hell no. I would never believe in God. There's too much clear evidence that there is a God. Why would I believe there's a God when I should know there's a God? Mm. The trees are coming up. The grass are coming up. The seasons are coming on time. Right. The sun and the moon are in sync doing their job every day. The stars up here like the Milky Way, even though you can't see stars now because of pollution. But back in the 60s, even in the cities, you could look up and see so many stars you couldn't imagine counting them. Wow. And they're still up there. But we can't see them for all of the lights in the city. It is physically impossible because of so much light in the cities and so much pollution in the cities. That's why when they have these uh, uh, scopes that look out into space and stuff in the stars, what do they call that? Uh, uh, telescope. Telescopes. They are on mountaintops in very remote places so that they won't have ambient light from cities getting into the lens. Mm -hmm. And they don't go, they're above the pollution levels. They have a high enough elevation on mountains to be over the pollution and over the clouds a lot to where they can see peer straight into space without distortion and oh. without interference. That's why that is. But that's why we can't see the stars anymore. Like right now, I'm looking up, I look out, not one star. But when I was a boy, I couldn't imagine a night without a billion, trillion, zillion stars. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't imagine. You can look in any direction you want. Just star, star, star. You could you could not see anything but stars up there. Mm. And the moon. <coughs> Crystal clear. But because we have so much pollution and so much light in the cities and stuff now, we cannot adore and see the stars and or the moon <clears throat> in their full glory anymore. Mm. You know, we see the moon from one side because as it orbits the earth, as the earth orbits the sun, <clears throat> as the sun is making its orbit in the Milky Way, mm -hmm. the moon does not spin around the earth it spins it goes well it spins around the earth but it doesn't spin while it's going in there it stays in sync right. and it always shows the same side mm -hmm. and i'm saying that to say that the devil has made his space stations and his space cities moon cities and stuff they are all all this stuff they built is on the back side of the moon Hmm. Because on a good day, one of the songs said, you can see forever. On a good day, when you can see the moon crystal clear at night, especially in the summertime, you could actually see what they were building, what they had on the moon, if it was on the front side. Right. Why would they not want to put it on the front side where people could see it? Hmm. Why would they want to put it on the back side of the moon? Hmm. If we need to give those types of things some thought. Yes, sir. I'm speaking of uh, Yeah, I want to ask you, speaking of the moons and stars and whatnot, and speaking of religion and uh, spirituality, I know people have raised some concerns with the minister of Farrakhan's and the Nation of Islam approach to or embracing Scientology. And I didn't get your thoughts. You think Brother Aziz or even Brother Khalil or any of those guys would be down with that? I would not think so. They would they would uh, acknowledge the uh, scholarship of the writings and teachings of uh, Scientology, as I do, mm -hmm. and as Minister Farrakhan has said, we all would acknowledge. I mean, right is right, good is good, true is true. Yeah, you know? and it's not optional. Mm -hmm. If you a man of God, if you a decent man of truth, then it's it's not optional. It is what it is. Truth can come from anywhere. You know, the devil quoted uh, God all the time to Jesus. You know, it's, it's something to think about that the devil is quoting scripture mm. in the Bible to Jesus. Now, you know, Jesus know what the devil know. Right. <laughs> they were both up in heaven together, uh, according to the book, 
with mm-hmm. God mm-hmm. himself. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it, it's, it's no reason for the devil to quote scripture to Jesus except that he bad witness to the truth. Mm. And then that Jesus bear witness that the devil is telling the truth in the Bible. Mm. And that's something. That's something. Right. Jesus is saying, yeah, you are right. But <laughs> he told Jesus to uh, cast himself down off the top, off the mount. See, it's written that the angels will catch you. And Jesus said, yeah, that's right. But you don't tempt the Lord God. You don't jump off of the hell of it is what he was saying. You mm-hmm. just don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know. And so although you telling the truth and all of what you saying is correct, devil, Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call him, mm-hmm. I'm not going to do that. It's not appropriate to do. You don't test God. You don't play with God. You don't just do something for the hell of it. Mm. You know. And so here's a case of Jesus and the devil having a conversation just like two people like you and I here mm. having in, 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 inter uh, uh, action with each other in the conversation and the devil and God are going back and forth making points saying yeah you right you know yeah. so that's something to, to, to give some consideration to truth can come from anywhere yeah. from the devil and, and Elijah Muhammad said the good that the white man do he said, follow it, do it. All the good you see him do, do it. You're not going to find that much, but do it. But the wicked that he do, leave that alone. Mm. And that's what Elijah Muhammad said. I'm quoting him on that. <clears throat> so what is your, your fondest memory of your, of your friend Skip Robinson? You got any memory in particular? Yeah, my fondest memories is just being at the special meetings other than at the mosque most of the time when he would teach the Christians about Christianity and Islam and have the whole church just wailing away and stuff. All I could tell is all the other folk was crying like me because I was crying so hard. Mm. And I haven't seen many people that could do that because I'm not a person that cry real easy. Mm. And so uh, normally my family stuff will make me cry even though I'm, I'm not one like to cry much but just normally you know I'm almost bulletproof to cry mm. but I was easy I cried all the time in fact when I would hear him speak I would almost expect to cry mm. and he wouldn't let me down <laughs> <laughs> he would teach so profoundly so clearly that you just you couldn't listen to him without actually being caught up and seeing yourself in what he said mm-hmm. you know he, he he was just that powerful and it's not anybody i've seen before or since then that had that type of charisma and power wow is he uh is he buried in mississippi or what, what happened to his remains he was yeah. buried there in mississippi in, in holly springs in or? holly springs mississippi yes okay. sir mm-hmm. well actually this also um i think it's very important with uh, Skip Robinson, I know he ran for sheriff of Marshall County twice. Correct? Is that correct? Right. Mm-hmm. And his house was firebomb, or yeah. How many times was his house bombed? I don't know, but they hated his guts. They tried to kill him on numerous occasions. And you feel like they finally succeeded? Yeah, uh, I feel like they finally succeeded. Uh, so did anybody ever came forth and offer y'all like a uh, confirmation about him being murdered? Did any like uh, clansmen or anybody ever came forth? To- no, no. But the people that were on the side of the highway where he had to wreck, five or six different people not even knowing each other, when I went down there to see what had happened, they all said the same thing. And it's unusual for different people at different times to say the same thing twice. And they say it over and over and over that they just let him lay out there and that they were saying all kind of negative stuff about him when he was laying out there in the field mm. before they say he gonna die today we gonna make sure he don't make it they, the, the policeman and the highway patrol was saying that openly out to people wow. about Aziz while he actually laid out on the ground and five or six different people told me that what are y'all black people 
Yeah. Uh -huh, they were all black people. They were all the, the patrol people, were they all white? Oh, oh, yeah. All, yeah, as far as I know, they were all white. Mm -hmm. So this happened on Highway 78? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. And so you said that he actually out there suffering. Yeah. Alive. He was alive after the wreck. And he no was all question. swelling up and just. Yeah. Um, wow. That's horrible. Yeah. And how old was he when he passed away? I don't know. He was probably around 60 mm. years old. Plus or minus five years. He could have been 55 or 65. Wow. Yeah, he was so black. When you real black and got that really proof, smooth, pretty skin, you might be 500 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you 20. You know, wow. there's no way you could tell. So yeah. how, how did it fall to you to identify the body? Why you out of everybody? Because they didn't know anybody else. I had a business and they didn't know anybody else to call up here. Mm -hmm. And they knew I was kind of a radical person mm -hmm. that would do what he's supposed to do, go ahead and take the situation by hand and do it. And as soon as they called me, I closed up instantly. I was at the morgue in less than 30 minutes. Mm, and that was in Memphis? After you, the call. You had yeah. identified the body in Memphis? Yes, sir. At John Gaston? Or? Right. Uh-huh. Wow. So, like, what happened to the Holly? I know you talked about the uh, Memphis mosque went on decline, but what about Holly Springs after the death of uh, it, Aziz? It has declined, uh, uh, some there are still the faithful soldiers that were there originally and most of them are there and some new ones I haven't been there in, a, in quite a while myself you know uh, after the Memphis mosque deteriorated so much I just left Islam alone I didn't want to be in the Memphis mosque because it's a non-progressive mosque mm. yeah all the leaders in the mosque all of the officers work for Pharaoh. And so I don't want to be in a mosque where the leadership work for the white man and uh, work with law enforcement mm. and 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 then gonna come and lead the people. So I wonder when the horn is the trumpet blows in the last day uh, and the nation calls for everybody to come in together mm. uh, to be with God's people and Pharaoh blows his horn and, and call for all his men to come in. I wonder which way is the leadership in Memphis going to go. Because wow. mm. every one of the officers works very closely for the government, for the city government in Memphis. And so to me, that is a major problem. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So you have any other words like to share with us, like thoughts? Yeah, well, under Elijah Muhammad back in the day, you can even join the nation and be a policeman. Mm. And you damn sure wasn't going to be an officer. Mm. And now, in the Memphis Mars, how or why, I don't know. Everybody in there is some kind of police or, or code enforcement or something. Got a badge and a pistol. You know, and I, I just think that's a horrific position for black leadership in the mosque to have when the mosque is supposed to show especially young black men to do for self, to work for self. Mm -hmm. And so how can you be a minister or a secretary or the captain of the men in the nation of Islam and you punching in with the with the, with the enemy every day? Hmm. You working for the police department. You working for the code enforcement, the city government. You working for them. Where is your uh, allegiance? Where is your example? Mm. If you don't have that type of example, you should not be in office. Why are grown men, 40 and 50 years old, still out selling newspapers and selling fruit for a living? Why is it the Nation of Islam does not have other businesses mm. that are... Uh, uh, foundation of uh, freestanding buildings like we used to have your supermarket your fish market your bakery we had uh uh all we had small hospitals we had different things that we had of our own right. now we don't have anything hmm. and to me that's a problem and, it, and and as long as black people think we can be free in America without a business foundation, 
we are doomed to fail. That is, we don't need any political anything. We don't need any leadership on anything, but some business. America is a business. America is a corporation. America is not a country like people think it is. America is a business. The business of America is business. Mm. And that's what America says itself. That's not me. I'm quoting what they got in the school books. Mm. At the Ivy League schools, they're teaching the business of America is business. We in the buying and selling. And if you're not buying or selling, you being traded. Mm. Wow. One of the two, one of the three, rather. And so these are the things we have to become cognizant of. If we are not dealing with business, we don't have anything coming. And all this Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff is, is something. It's better than nothing. It's a stab in the dark. But we have to elevate ourselves and come into consciousness that we have to erect some business. We are only consumers. We are in the business of working from kin to can't, from dark to, to light to dark again, mm -hmm. and spending our money up in rent, utilities, and vices like cigarettes and dope and beer. That's, that's what we do. Mm. And that's why we cannot get ahead. In the midst of all these things going on, where is Al Sharpton? Where's Jesse Jackson? Where's our black leadership in these things? Where is Obama mm. in speaking up for the people? Yeah, he got plenty of rhetoric for us. He'll come out and say, that could be me. That could be my son. But after the trauma, how did he make his little speech? He doesn't change any laws. He doesn't do anything. Mm. He's not helping us. And I'm sure he's going to get out of office and being a Nobel laureate, he's going to want to be the next Martin Luther King for mm. black people. But how can we trust that when he's been in the seat in the big house and hadn't done anything significant for us? He did get the brothers out of jail with the inadequacy and the injustice between the three little rocks and the shoebox full of cocaine getting different sentences. You get 10 to 15 years mandatory sentence for three little eraser head rocks. Mm -hmm. But you could have a shoebox full of cocaine that you can make a thousand rocks out of. But you can't make cocaine out of rocks, but you can make rocks out of cocaine. And those people, you can have a shoebox full of cocaine and only get three to five years mandatory sentencing. Mm. But three little eraser size of rocks, you get 10 to 15 years mandatory sentencing. So where's the justice in that? And that happened under the first black president. Uh, uh, he said he black, first black president, <laughs> uh, uh, Clinton. Right. Yeah. And so... When we look at these things, we have to wonder, as Marvin Gaye would say, what's going on? Hmm. Oh, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, what about the, uh, before I go, the boycott, the uh, justice or else? Yes. Not one dime. Is that effective? Would it be effective? No, sir. Okay. And nothing going to be effective against the white man because the white man is what he always has been and always will be. He's a homicidal maniac. And what he's going to do is keep killing us and keep killing us as long as we willing to lay down and die. He's going to kill us. All right, brother. And it's not for us to kill each other. But until <clears throat> he started receiving the same thing that he dishing out, it won't stop. But as soon as he reaps what he sows, it'll stop like that. Wow. Well, brother, I want to thank you so much in the words of Greg DeGelton. We love you madly and keep on producing and pushing and spreading the news. The pleasure is mine. Yes, sir. You have a good day. Allah be with you all. And stay strong and get prepared because it's already going down. World War Three 
is Armageddon. And mm -hmm. Armageddon and World War Three have already started. You've already got Syria there. You've got Russia there. Mm -hmm. You've got China there. And uh, China and Russia have been there for months. Right. But the news just let it out that Russia was there a month ago. Mm -hmm. But China was there then. Mm. And you got France there in Syria. You've got Great Britain. And you got America. Now, France doesn't have but one aircraft carrier. <laughs> and they got it sent down there in the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Trying to make some flexible muscles and be tough. But the largest and biggest three aircrafts in the world now, I think, are held by China. Mm. And so that's something for us to give some thought to. And China has a 300 million man army dressed out already, a standing army. Uh -huh. And we have just a few more than 300 million people in the whole United States. China can stand the war. China needs a war and China wants a war because when they started the one family, one child policy, uh, most families opted to have a boy to carry on their name and kill the girls or aborted the girls and stuff. And so now you got all these men in China with no women. Mm. And just for the note in closing, this is the first time in the history of the world that there are more men in the world than there are women. Mm. So war is going down. And one other thing, and I'll let it go. Every country has adopted their policy now uh, as far as the draft goes that any person in their country that's between the ages of 18 and 30, or 35, whatever the age is, mm -hmm. have to register for the draft, whether they're in that country legally, illegally, or uh, whatever, whether they, whatever, because every country now is going to draft all these people, they are undesirables, and send them to war and kill them over there in that thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the last things Elijah Muhammad said is that one day, in the end time that America will go and fight in the Middle East in a foreign land and they going over by the hundreds of thousands to fight. Mm -hmm. He said, but they will only come back in the teens. Mm. Thank you so much, Brother Al. What's your full name? Just Brother Al. Brother Al. Everything recorded. Yeah, I don't need nobody. <laughs> How I got it, yes, sir. I'm not afraid at all, but it's just a boy and a lot of stupid stuff, and I don't want to deal yes, with sir, that, but bro, I'm I... well able and capable. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Yeah, bro, I don't hesitate. Bro, thank you so much once again, and have a great one. Appreciate you. Uh, my pleasure. Yes, sir.